Our Lunch and Learn programmes are held on the second Friday of the month and are sponsored by Friends of Georgia Archives and History. Thank you, Fogo. During this pandemic, we want to offer you Lunch and Learn programmes safely in a virtual format. As always, we are thankful that our colleague Alec Hawthorne is taking care of the technical side of these virtual presentations. The video of this program will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, Georgia Archives. So if you have friends and family who are unable to watch the presentations live, they don't have to miss out and can always see them later on our YouTube channel. Just remember to subscribe. We are pleased to have as our April Lunch and Learn presenter, Jeff Morrison, who will answer any of your questions at the end of the presentation. Tell you a little bit about Jeff. Jeff is an architect, author, and photographer with a Master's of Architecture degree from Tulane University. He is currently a practicing architect at Good Van Slyke Architecture. His architectural projects span a range of building types, usually in civic or educational settings, and tend to be inspired by contextualism, materiality, and creating a sense of place. He has taught design studios at Kennesaw State University School of Architecture and built a sculptural installation for the inaugural art on the Beltline. Jeff has lived in the historic neighborhoods of Atlanta since 1996. We are very happy to welcome Jeff. Thank you, Penny. Um, hi, everybody. It's uh, certainly a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, at the archives today. Um, <clears throat> uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, the history of Underground and the Railroad Gulch. Um, as Penny said, I'm an architect with Good Man Slag Architecture, um, and I'm also the, the author of Atlanta Underground History from Below, which is a recently published book um, that has a narrative history of this particular part of uh, downtown that is paired and contrasted with a series of black and white architectural photographs that I've taken um, from beneath the uh, streets. So um, Atlanta uh, really was built around the junction of three railroads. And um, so I'll be talking about how the city grew up around those railroads and uh, eventually grew over spanning across those railroads with an elevated street grid. And then with the decline of passenger rail traffic, how the city has tried to reoccupy the space um, that had been used for the uh, railroad junctions. So when I talk about underground and the gulch, um, they're kind of uh, loosely defined terms. In this illustration, um, the red lines show where these um, railroad lines, these three railroad tracks come into downtown. Um, there are still active rail lines in each direction and um, they form this triangular junction and the large space in between, the whitish space, um, <clears throat> is where the old railroad yards used to be and uh, that's nominally referred to as the gulch. And then uh, this other leg over here on the right, um, kind of uh, south of uh, Five Points intersection, is what we refer to as underground, underground Atlanta, uh, which is specifically along uh, Alabama Street. So um, these are kind of uh, loosely applied terms, but they generally referred to the area uh, that had been occupied by the railroad depots and railroad yards downtown. Um, and the other thing they have in common is that they were um, all eventually spanned across by the elevated streets um, and now have this uh, sort of separate uh, area beneath the street grid. 
So <clears throat> I uh, came to Atlanta with an interest in railroad history, and I started um, exploring downtown, looking for artifacts and remnants of uh, the grand days of the railroads. Uh, and what I found was this. Um, there's, of course, uh, no more railroad depots downtown. Um, very few um, remnants of the uh, railroad history and even very few historical structures. But uh, as I looked a little bit more closely, I did find um, traces of the history. And in fact, in this picture, you can see these uh, curving lines in the paving of this uh, parking lot are actually tracing the arcs um, of the uh, railroad tracks as seen in that previous picture. So I started exploring a little bit deeper um, and got further and further into these uh, fascinating spaces underneath the um, street grid. And while there's little to no trace of the rich uh, history of the area, um, as an architect, I found them really amazing spaces in their own way. Um, so at the same time that I was exploring <clears throat> this kind of uh, warren of service spaces, I was also uh, digging deeper and deeper into the um, written history of this area. And um, so then uh, almost on a whim, I strung together a little walking tour that I offered to some friends of mine who are interested in history and preservation. And um, word started to spread and uh, I, I was asked to give it again and again. And um, so I uh, started giving what I call the Unseen Underground Walking Tour. At the time, uh, Underground Atlanta was still quite popular as a um, tourist destination. And so I call it Unseen Underground as kind of the exploration of everything else uh, that was hidden behind it. And um, I just uh, promoted it by word of mouth and um, never uh, sold tickets or anything but uh, gradually accumulated a pretty good following. Um, some of the tour groups were uh, pretty large in size. I got some coverage in the uh, Atlanta Journal-Constitution <clears throat> and uh, was awarded Best of Atlanta by Creative Loafing and Atlanta Magazine. And so I started uh, giving uh, tours to uh, groups of architectural students and city planners and um, city officials. Um, and at the same time, I began photographing the places that I was uh, exploring um, with kind of an architectural eye, trying to capture the, um, these immense spaces that are sort of inhuman and uh, hyper-industrial, but at the same time, um, are built, uh, there's always a sense of um, how they're occupied in some way. Uh, I was trying to capture, of course, the play of light and shadow, as well as this uh, tension between um, what's there now and what used to be there. <clears throat> and um, there's also this sense that they're kind of abandoned, but at the same time, many of them are vessels for very huge amounts of people, um, like the arena, arenas and the tailgating areas on game day. So um, it all seems like a place that's very static and abandoned, but in fact, it's rather dynamic and always changing. Um, this is um, an aerial view with uh, a list of some of the really significant things that are um, bordering the Gulch um, between the um, World Congress Center and Georgia State University and the government complexes in South Downtown. And so um, <clears throat> currently there's quite a few uh, projects that are on the boards or in early development um, that could really transform the area of the Gulch. 
This is a concept of the redevelopment of underground Atlanta itself uh, by WRS, uh, which has now recently been sold to a group called the Billionaires Funding Group. Um, so <clears throat> this is showing um, further uh, development above and alongside underground Atlanta. This is a concept rendering of the South Downtown area by Newport who has acquired uh, several dozen parcels um, and uh, individual historic structures, which they intend to be renovating and then adding infill uh, in a very uh, incremental approach to rebuilding the neighborhood. And uh, this is the uh, an early rendering <clears throat> of the Centennial Yards development. Um, uh, also known as the Gulch redevelopment by CIM, where they um, really plan to cap the entire portion of the uh, parking lots that are uh, adjacent to the stadiums and the arena and add um, mixed use development on top of that. So um, <clears throat> in addition to that, there's plans to um, renovate the Five Points MARTA station um, and other things that are happening uh, alongside the uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium. But uh, in order for these projects to really uh, take hold and have meaning, I think it's very important to uh, have a strong understanding of um, what this place is and um, the significance it has in the city. So that takes us all the way back to the very earliest days uh, before there was even a city here. Um, <clears throat> and we begin our story at this location, which is actually a water treatment facility um, on the west side of Atlanta. It is the site of uh, Fort Peachtree, which was established in 1814. Um, <clears throat> at the point where Peachtree Creek joins the Chattahoochee River. It was uh, built um, alongside a Native American village known as Standing Peachtree, which uh, was along the border between the Creek and Cherokee Indian lands. Um, <clears throat> there has always been some debate as to the origin of the name Standing Peachtree. Some people thought that it was uh, actually referring to a um, prominent peach tree uh, on that location, although uh, that would have been pretty unusual because peach trees um, were not native to the area and it would have been very early for one to be present there. There is another theory that it was actually a derivation of pitch tree referring to the pitch or the um, sap that came from the uh, local pine trees. But either way, um, the name gave its name to Peachtree Creek and Fort Peachtree, and the trail that led from there to another fort in Grunette was called Peachtree Trail, and uh, that trail is still um, follows a lot of the alignment of modern-day Peachtree Road and Peachtree Street. Um, the only other thing really in this vicinity at that time was Whitehall Tavern, which was down near what is now uh, West End. Um, <clears throat> so uh, in 1836, a railroad was built from the city of Charleston to Augusta, and uh, it was quite notable at the time. It was actually the world's longest railroad at that time and it was um, operating the first regularly scheduled passenger service with this little train called the Best Friend of Charleston, um, which chugged along at maybe 10 to 15 miles an hour. Um, but it was very early technology, but it was showing that it was uh, practical and important. Um, and the uh, leaders here in the state of Georgia saw that as an important example um, and started to imagine a way to um, use railroads uh, to develop 
the internal uh, areas of the state of Georgia that were just being opened up from the Native Americans. Um, the uh, railroads were an early technology, but they made more sense compared to canals for covering the long distances and the topography in the south. So the state of Georgia actually decided to charter its own railroad that would start uh, on the Tennessee River near what is now Chattanooga and come south through the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains and cross the Chattahoochee River and then stop uh, really in the middle of wilderness. This is uh, an early survey actually dating from uh, the Civil War. And uh, the idea was that this railroad, which was called the Western and Atlantic Railroad, um, <clears throat> would itself become a destination and other private railroads that were already being built westward from the coast would then um, uh, establish this as a destination point and those railroads would build towards this to complete uh, the network. And so in 1837, Stephen Long uh, drove the stake into the ground, um, marking the end of the survey of the Western and Atlantic Railroad in what was really just a uh, wilderness. And here you can see a great map um, showing the city of Decatur, uh, city of Marietta and Lawrenceville in existence and um, no um, a designation for the city of Atlanta, but you can see that point where these railroads come together. So from the upper left, the Western Atlantic um, was built and then <clears throat> coming westward from Augusta was the Georgia Railroad, which also connected back to Charleston. And then coming north from Macon was the Macon and Western. Um, and so those railroads all connected at this location. And um, it did in fact uh, create this network of railroads that now connected the Atlantic Ocean and the Tennessee River and the uh, Gulf of Mexico. And so the state by creating sort of half of a railroad out into the middle of nowhere, um, uh, really helped to create this very important uh, network of railroads across the Southeast. So um, here is a bird's eye view and you can clearly see uh, those railroads forming that early triangular junction. Um, <clears throat> up to the top is the Western Atlantic Railroad, over to the right, the Georgia Railroad, and then down to the left, the Macon and Western, and then just um, south of town, it branched off and another railroad, the Atlanta and West Point, was built to Montgomery, um, which continued down to the Gulf. So, um, in uh, 1837, that original endpoint of the railroad was um, nominally about where uh, State Farm Arena is today. And then in 1842, there was a bit of a land swap. A guy named Samuel Spencer offered some additional land to the state as a public square and room for the uh, passenger station. Um, in exchange for them moving uh, the endpoint of the railroad onto his land. And that was um, closer to where Central Avenue is now. And um, so that established what we call the uh, milepost zero. And then when the uh, Western Atlantic Railroad construction was finally completed end to end in 1850, they set these stone milepost markers at every mile along the route. And at that point, um, the stone milepost zero was set um, near underground Atlanta. It says zero zero on one side and 138 on the other side. And um, that remained in place um, until 2018 when it was uh, finally uh, relocated to the Atlanta History Center. So um, here you can see some of the railroad structures that were beginning to be built around the uh, tracks. Um, the Union Depot and the Georgia Railroad Freight Depot are down in the lower right hand corner. Um, up on the left, you see a little locomotive chugging along um, 
the uh, left-hand leg of the railroad junction um, when the railroad, the, the first piece of the railroad junction that was constructed was that little earthen embankment that you see there. Um, it was called the Monroe Embankment for what was then known as the Monroe Railroad. And um, the contractor who uh, was engaged to build that embankment was cousin John Thrasher. And so before anything exe else existed in this area, he had a settlement of workmen and um, it was loosely referred to as Thrasherville for John Thrasher. And so um, that was the earliest very informal name for the settlement. And at the same time um, on the maps, it was literally just the end of the line of this survey. So it was known as Terminus. Both of those were very informal names. Then in um, 1842, um, <clears throat> sorry, in 1841, uh, no, sorry, 1843, I want to get that right. Um, there was enough people here for a post office and it was called Marthasville, named for Martha Lumpkin, the daughter of uh, the governor. Um, but the name Marthasville did not take off very well, it did not become popular. This was very much a town of frontiersmen and um, railroad people, workers and settlers. And um, I don't even know if they called themselves Martha's Villians or what. It just didn't fit. And so in 1845, just two years later, the Georgia Railroad completed its construction. And um, on their depot, they went ahead and they made up this name Atlanta. And um, it was really just a made up name, kind of a derivation of Atlantic, maybe. Um, there are stories that it was derived from the Greek goddess Atalanta, um, but uh, regardless of where it came from, um, it uh, seemed to fit the population much better, and um, so it quickly became adopted as the uh, actual name of the city. Here you can see an early map of the city uh, with its original circular limits, and um, the very center of that circle was actually the uh, milepost zero marker, the endpoint of the railroad, which um, also was at the corner of the first passenger station. Um, you can see the distinctive um, um, curvature of the railroads also. And then you see our kind of seemingly chaotic collision of street grids that we have downtown. Um, <clears throat> so on this map, I've highlighted the original um, trails that were here, um, Indian trails, wagon trails, um, the uh, peach tree trail that uh, nominally follows a low ridge line, um, and then Marietta and, and the Decatur Road. Um, and then next to that, you see the geometry of the railroads, which were surveyed based off of the topography and the turning radius of trains. And then overlaid over that is this square grid. Um, so the state divided all of the land into land lots and um, gave it away actually in a lottery, trying to promote people to settle deep into the wilderness of the interior of the state. And um, so as each landowner developed their particular land lot, they uh, laid out the street grid, in some cases uh, in a true north-south grid, and in other cases that grid is rotated to align with one of the original roads or uh, aligned with the railroads. And so um, then when you step back again, you can see how those um, individual land lots uh, create these uh, rather unusual collisions of street grids, uh, even though we don't have any um, dominating uh, natural features that would uh, require that. So this was the uh, passenger terminal that was built in 1853. It was a large brick structure on the uh, open air that the trains actually passed directly through. Um, <clears throat> And then this is that same structure in 1864. So the creation of this network of railroads 
uh, crossing the South really established Atlanta as a key strategic point during the Civil War because it was a center point of transportation and also manufacturing. So um, when uh, Sherman came on his campaign, he targeted the railroads and all of the railroad infrastructure um, as critical elements um, that were supporting the um, Confederacy. This is the uh, freight depot that was built serving the Georgia Railroad. Um, that long shed end of it actually still exists. So this was built in 1869. It is um, now the oldest building still remaining in the downtown portion of Atlanta. Um, the end of it with the three stories and the little cupola on top burned in uh, the 1930s, but the remainder of it still exists and is operated as an events facility um, by the state just next to underground Atlanta. This is uh, another picture of the end of that. Um, this is a similar uh, freight depot that was built uh, at the other end of the gulch uh, with a roundhouse, locomotive roundhouse behind it. Um, then um, to replace the original uh, Union Depot, a second one was built at the same location in 1871. This one made out of cast iron with this distinctive um, kind of fan uh, emblem at the end of it. Um, and then here it is a few years later uh, where the end had been enclosed by glass. Uh, so this is an aerial view showing that um, second Union Depot in the center with its long uh, vaulted roof. And just below it is the freight depot for the uh, Georgia Railroad. Uh, next to the depot with their, where those trees are is uh, the State Square. And then just above the depot, you see the Kimball House, which was um, this amazing ornate Victorian style hotel that served the passengers who were arriving uh, at the station. Um, so here you can see um, as the city is building up more and more, around um, the railroad junction. In the center, you can make out um, that vaulted roof of the um, passenger station. Um, <clears throat> by uh, the 1890s, um, you can see more and more development of railroad yards and facilities inside this junction. And then uh, an additional bypass was made here along what was then Elliott Street. Um, and uh, eventually that claimed all of this as um, area for railroad facilities. And um, so currently the north-south railroad tracks that still run through the gulch are roughly along this alignment that had been Elliott Street. Uh, and then down over here in this corner, you can make out the uh, passenger depot. Uh, here's that same vantage point. Uh, there are a number of great photographs and even the bird's eye views that all have this uh, similar vantage point um, across downtown Atlanta. Um, <clears throat> they were probably all taken from the uh, state capitol building looking in this direction. Um, again, you can see the little cupola of the freight depot, um, the passenger depot behind it, and then the Kimball house right there. So as we get into the 20th century, um, cities across America um, really become, uh, continue taking their shape around um, the modernization of the railroads and how it was so important to um, really every aspect of people's everyday lives. Um, so here we are um, in 1919, and um, in 1905, Terminal Station was built over here on this end of the gulch. So from that point on, uh, Atlanta was served by both Union Station over here and Terminal Station, um, <clears throat> which served different railroads depending on um, what direction you were going in. Um, and you can see uh, more, uh, more and more uh, industrial and railroad uh, occupation within the gulch here. 
Um, and so uh, by about 1910, Atlanta had no less than 10 different railroad lines coming into it from all different points of the compass. Uh, and to give you some context, the area we've been looking at is this tiny little point right here. And so all these railroads came in and kind of this spaghetti network. Um, this also shows that while all of the passenger service came into the two terminals at the Gulch, um, the, each railroad had its own rail yard for handling freight service, and those tended to be out uh, in the outer suburbs. And then also for context, there was the series of sort of um, bypass tracks that were built individually um, in a disconnected fashion, but they, uh, this is basically what we now know of as the Atlanta Beltline around the city. Um, so this is a terminal station built in 1905, um, serving the Southern Railroad and its family of railways. Uh, you can see that it was um, in its design actually already addressing the prominence of the automobile with this large forecourt and it was built uh, already elevated up above the level of the railroad tracks. And then back here in the distance, you see this little structure was an interlocking tower um, that controlled the um, all the tracks and the switches and the signals coming in from the south end of the junction. And uh, while um, Terminal Station was demolished in the 70s, this little structure remained uh, until about uh, 2018. And uh, the building behind it is actually uh, office buildings for the Southern Railroad, uh, those still stand and um, have recently been renovated uh, as apartments. Here you can see um, in the foreground down here, the large train shed uh, for the tracks at Terminal Station, which is over here. Um, and so going off in this direction is um, over towards um, the uh, other uh, Union Station. And you can also see Spring Street here uh, that had been built spanning over the tracks. Um, this is a train um, pulling into Union Station. And um, so it's important to remember that uh, people weren't just traveling on vacations or long trips across the country. They were really using trains for um, just about every mode of transportation. So even just day trips to come in to go shopping at Rich's or this is Peachtree Arcade, which was um, also next to uh, what's now Five Points Marta Station. Um, and uh, so um, <clears throat> this is an early picture from 1914 where you can see that um, the number of railroad tracks is really multiplying and um, trains were getting larger and larger in this, while the city, the commercial district had grown up around the railroad tracks, um, it was really becoming kind of an inhospitable place um, for pedestrians. In 1930, Union Station was uh, rebuilt um, a little bit further to the east in this uh, little neoclassical building, um, which then had walkways that went down to the tracks and so this also was built at this elevated level above the tracks. You can see them passing directly beneath it. Um, so here's a map that shows all of the railroad tracks coming into the city. And you can also see um, one of the freight railroad yards here and over here, and then more freight railroad yards over there. Um, and this is a detail of that. And each one of these lines represents a track coming through um, downtown. And um, so uh, there were a number of ideas, even from very early on, about um, how to deal with this area that was becoming more and more industrialized right in the heart of the city. And there was an architect and urban planner named Harrison Bleckley 
um, who spent quite a long time developing a series of drawings depicting uh, these grand civic plazas that span across all of the tracks downtown um, and created this uh, outdoor public space. And um, here you can see this great uh, cartoon on the left showing the Smoky Gulch, the Smoky Gulch, and then on the right, this beautiful uh, plaza that it could become. And um, he promoted that for several years, but um, it never uh, really got traction enough to get uh, funded and built out. Um, this is another great concept that was just a proposal, but it was a series of underground tunnels with uh, moving sidewalks to alleviate the congestion, the congestion of pedestrians on the sidewalks. Um, and this was later on a proposal to cap the area with um, freeways. Um, I think we're all thankful that uh, that didn't come to fruition. And um, this was a later concept with um, this uh, great little mass transit going through. Um, this view is also nominally uh, about where the Mapa Zero was. Um, so um, none of those came to be, but um, there were a series of bridges that were built spanning over the tracks. So this is actually Alabama Street on the side of underground Atlanta before the bridges were built, looking to the east. And at the end, you can see the little cupola at the end of the Georgia Railroad uh, freight depot. And then this is that same view a few years later where you can see under construction are the pillars for the elevated street. So beginning in um, 1928, the city built uh, bridges spanning across the railroad tracks, uh, and they also built bridges parallel along uh, Wall Street here and then Alabama Street over here. And um, so that created this elevated network of streets that actually um, connected directly to the face of the existing buildings. So uh, most buildings um, established their new uh, front doors at this elevated street level. Um, <clears throat> and then the space below was uh, left over for service uses. And as more and more buildings uh, filled in this area, it became harder to tell um, when you were um, on ground and when you were on this elevated street level. Uh, in 1943, Plaza Park was built right along uh, Peachtree Street, actually spanning over the railroad tracks. So this was the first public space that was built above the railroad tracks. And uh, there were these little concrete mushroom sort of canopy benches, which were actually funnels um, that were directly in line with the railroad tracks below. So I like to imagine little puffs of locomotive smoke coming up out of those um, little uh, mushrooms. This is also Plaza Park um, with the old uh, Kimball House still looming over it. Um, and this is now the site of the cascading fountain plaza that leads into underground. Um, Kimball House is no longer there, but this little modern building is still over there on that street corner. And this is uh, Peachtree Street back here in the background. Um, so here you can see in the 1940s, really the peak of the build out of the railroad junction and the density of these tracks and then um, how these viaducts are starting to span over it um, <clears throat> and uh, really becoming more and more of an industrialized area. And then um, gradually these uh, streets even stretched across uh, this far end of the gulch uh, and you can start to see this sort of um, the geometry of the street grid overlaid over the railroad tracks. Um, so by the 1960s, uh, passenger rail traffic was really declining, of course, because of competition from the uh, highways and um, air traffic. 
um, both from um, uh, individuals traveling and also from freight traffic and even the mail that was no longer um, being hauled um, by trains. And so in 1971 and 72, both Terminal Station and the Third Union Station were demolished and uh, the last of the passenger service was consolidated into Amtrak, which stopped at um, the little uh, Brookwood station. And so passenger trains, um, because of the um, connecting route, um, don't even pass through the gulch anymore. Um, <clears throat> so the city was left with this uh, area right in the heart of downtown. And uh, there were a number of um, interesting uh, efforts made to uh, start to occupy and reactivate that space. Um, this unfortunately is a tiny little view uh, because it's low resolution, but um, you can see there was a combination of grand civic uh, things that occupied the large space available. And then these uh, more unusual sort of entertainment ideas like Underground Atlanta. Um, <clears throat> this was the Crystal Bridge um, at Rich's department store that was known for it's um, Christmas lighting and uh, of course Riches was also known for the Pink Pig, this uh, little suspended monorail. Um, then in 1969, um, the uh, abandoned storefronts under Alabama Street were sort of uh, rediscovered um, and developed as a, a jazz nightclub district. And um, so it was very popular for a number of years um, and uh, not only had nightclubs, but it had um, some a musical museum and some uh, unusual things. And at that time, you could still walk right up uh, to the zero mile post. Um, <clears throat> this is Chico the monkey, who was part of the uh, musical museum. Um, this was a very unusual um, a souvenir shop uh, run by Lester Maddox, the former governor of Georgia. Um, and then in uh, the late 1970s, uh, the city started uh, developing um, the Georgia World Congress Center, these massive convention halls. And then this is the Omni Center, which included um, a, a coliseum and um, hotel and office space. Inside the Omni, there was the skating rink and this giant escalator that actually led up to the world's largest indoor amusement park, the world of Sid and Marty Croft, um, which was pretty fascinating, but uh, only lasted for a few months because um, they were still having a lot of trouble um, trying to uh, establish this part of downtown as something that could be seen as a family-friendly destination. Um, also in the Omni, this was uh, Burt's Joint, which was a nightclub owned by uh, Burt Reynolds. Um, then in the late 70s, um, the uh, construction of the MARTA rail lines uh, was very uh, disruptive to the area. This is the construction of the Five Points Station. Um, and so Underground Atlanta and Alabama Street is right over here. Um, to build the east-west tracks for MARTA, they had to uh, demolish a whole row of buildings that had been on the north side of Underground Atlanta. Um, and then also about that time, I think in 1975, there was a fire that destroyed a number of buildings uh, in Underground Atlanta. So, um, <clears throat> Underground closed and um, was uh, bought by the city and they spent a great deal of uh, time and money redeveloping it, this time as um, kind of a shopping mall, what they call a festival marketplace. That was this time very family oriented and it was more of a retail and food court kind of a space. Um, and uh, it, in many ways, it really became an important gathering place for uh, the whole city. 
um, for several decades and was a very popular tourist destination. Um, <clears throat> something else that was um, an attraction in that area was the New Georgia Railroad, which uh, offered excursion trains that um, left from a small depot that was built uh, next to underground right at the zero mile marker. And then uh, the world of Coca-Cola uh, was built right next to underground and helped to add to the um, synergy um, establishing that as a very important um, tourist destination. But uh, following the Olympics, um, Centennial Olympic Park was established on the other side of downtown between the convention halls and uh, the hotels on Peachtree Street. And um, that really became um, the new center point for tourist destinations. And so the World of Coke moved over there in 2007. Um, <clears throat> and um, so this is kind of an outline of all of those um, things uh, in that era um, surrounding the Gulch. So um, we're still left with these questions of how do we uh, really um, uh, re-engage the Gulch? Um, there's a lot of plans for things that can uh, be built there, but in order for them to really uh, be meaningful and be connected with the city, um, it's important to not just uh, see it as a whole that needs to be filled, um, but really have an understanding of um, uh, how the space is significant to the city. And so in my research, it's been interesting to me that I found a number of uh, themes that have been consistent really from the very uh, earliest beginnings of the city. So we've always been known for um, our welcoming hospitality and for being sort of a boom town and very aggressive go growth and um, being a good place for business and self-promotion and this thing called boosterism. Um, and so these themes we recognize uh, today, but um, they really date back from the very earliest days when um, people were settling here uh, around the railroads really faster than they could even build buildings. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so um, the other thing is that Atlanta has always been uh, a city of immigrants. It's always been a place where people are moving here and, um, and oftentimes they are seeing it as an opportunity to give up something of their past um, for the sake of creating a new future for themselves. And so uh, to some extent, I think this uh, can explain why the city has um, a very unique relationship to its own past, right? So people come here with this um, motivation to um, start something new. And so maybe it's not unexpected that we have a similar relationship to our own built environment where uh, it seems so often um, people are more concerned about building new things for the future and less interested in um, preserving or even recognizing the importance of things from the past. Um, <clears throat> and um, so uh, another, um, um, let's see, sorry, I lost my place for a second there. Um, so uh, it's important that we um, keep in mind that these uh, important things have uh, been taking place on this ground and in this territory. And um, if we're um, going to be rebuilding, oh yes, I wanted to mention that um, we also have an unusual relationship to this uh, area that I like to call our dry riverbed um, because where many cities were built around um, a waterfront or a harbor uh, and as the um, 
nature of their downtown changed and became less industrialized, they um, revitalized the downtown, um, seeing those waterfronts as an amenity. But in Atlanta, um, you know, we're left with this uh, sort of abandoned railroad junction. And um, it uh, poses the question of how do we fill this hole and make it an amenity that still has a um, connection to the past. And so I do think that it is um, going to be more important uh, rather than just filling it in um, with uh, something kind of anonymous that whatever we do comes from this um, connection back to where we came from. That we have an understanding of uh, why it is the way it is and uh, what it means to us. So um, with that, I want to um, point out a couple of great resources. Uh, my book has uh, not very many historical photographs in it. And one reason for that is that um, we have uh, quite a few great resources of um, photographic histories of the city. Um, and uh, one of them, when Atlanta took the train, is specifically about the uh, railroad depots downtown. Um, and uh, I've been um, collecting my own resources on this website, www.atlantafrombelow.com. Um, has information about my tours and about my book. Um, you can also follow me on Facebook at Unseen Underground Walking Tour. Um, you can uh, find uh, the book at uh, most local bookstores. If they don't have it on the shelf, you can order it. Um, if you would like signed copies, um, you can uh, email me directly at that email, uh, jemorrison at bellsouth.net. You can also contact me through the website. I don't do sales through the website right now, but you can email me directly. Um, I can also produce um, uh, large format prints of any of the images from the books uh, for sale. Um, so with that, I will um, open it up for questions. We have a few questions. Um, is any of the main terminal station uh, still standing? Uh, that's from Jenny. She wants to know if any of it's still standing in the main terminal station. Uh, yes, no. So unfortunately, none of Terminal Station remains. Um, it was torn down in 1972. Um, the one piece that remained was that little interlocking tower, um, which was uh, actually had been still owned by the railroad and in preparation for the um, development of the gulch. The railroad finally tore down in 2018. Okay. Um, people say thank you. Going to publish. Um, here we have question: Is Brookwood Station still used? The trains or passenger trains? Uh, yes. So Brookwood Station is our um, station for Amtrak passenger trains. Um, it was uh, built there on that location as sort of a suburban station originally. And then um, uh, because the Amtrak service uh, really goes in a single line um, through Atlanta on the old Southern Railway route, it didn't have a need to go through the Gulch. Um, so um, it still serves. It's a beautiful old building, um, but it, um, Functionally, is not really well suited for the way Amtrak is using it. Um, every once in a while, they talk about uh, replacing it. There are some people who have an idea of rebuilding um, a grand new sort of destination terminal in, in the Gulch that uh, they often refer to as the multimodal passenger terminal. Um, <clears throat> but there are no um, specific plans for any of that uh, at this point. Jenny, um shared a story. She said that her first train ride was on the Nancy Hanks to Columbus, Georgia back in the early 50s. Yeah, I hear a lot of references to the Nancy Hanks, uh, which was 
not a really famous streamliner, but it was um, near and dear to the people of Atlanta because it uh, really covered daily trips uh, from Atlanta through Macon to Savannah, and it was um, just sort of part of everyday life for a lot of people. Um, we have a question on some of the earlier bird's eye views. Mm -hmm. um, how were they made? Yeah, so um, it is my belief that the earliest um, hand-drawn bird's eye views, uh, I'm not an expert on this, but I think they would have um, used uh, hot air balloons that were lifted up and the person would have uh, made a hand sketch from that or possibly even um, you know, just an accurate survey of the area from the ground and then just um, conceived of the bird's eye view. Uh, before the state capitol, that same location, which is actually on a little bit of a, a hill, um, was the site of the old um, county courthouse and city hall. Um, we have a final question. Did you use the Georgia State University archives or map collections to research your work? Uh, I did, certainly. The archives are a great resource, uh, as well as the um, Georgia State University archives, the um, Atlanta History Center. Um, I uh, pulled from a lot of sources and, uh, you know, Atlanta has a lot of books that are sort of um, stories that get told uh, over and over. And when I first started researching for my walking tours, um, I found that there are a lot of these things that had kind of become myths. So um, I went to uh, considerable effort to um, uh, get to the bottom of a lot of these stories to make sure that they were as accurate as I could. I think that's all the questions. Jeff. Great. Okay. Thank you again. I want to thank Jeff for a fascinating presentation and you, they can contact you at the website about future tours, say after COVID, yep. you're going to be doing future tours, which would be really, really exciting. We really appreciate you joining us here. Um, thank you for the questions. Thank you for coming. Um, in May, on May the 14th, our lunch and learn program is Donald Lee Hollowell, foot soldier of equal justice presented by award-winning professional storyteller Akbar Imhotep. So thank you so much for joining us.